Hey guys, Mike Noel here with Blockchain Weekly. Um, it's Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern time, and that means we're about to waste another perfectly good hour talking about all things blockchain. Uh, at Blockchain Weekly, we try to talk about things that are involved in um, smart contracts, rationalizing uh, workflows, using distributed ledger, and the, and the types of things that we're doing um, with businesses and distributed ledger as opposed to uh, investing and things of that nature, speculation. Um, so this is going to be um, a, a, an hour of geek's paradise where we're, we're going to take apart the, the blockchain. And uh, we do have a very special guest today, Michael Anton Adam of Doc Launch. He's going to be talking about things that happen off chain and some of the things that he's working on that are live today with with distributed ledger and and how some of the things that he how he can help companies who want to get involved in distributed ledger and that type of technology it's going to be an interesting conversation today and you don't want to miss it a um, couple of things going on this week and and once again mike it it looks like you're uh uh you, you've got some weather up there some another nor'easter coming down so Wow, that uh, I, I hate to tell you, I'm, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's uh, I think it's sunny and 71 degrees out in Phoenix today. So we're not having that issue. So if you want to take some of the cold weather and bring it our way, that's fine. We would appreciate that. And thanks to Shindig for this lovely uh, software that they let us use. This event is is housed and, and sponsored by Shindig. And and if, if you guys want to talk to one another, you can. You can join one another. You can share and talk to one another while we're on, on stage. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, when you ask questions, we'll either uh, ask the question online and talk about it, hopefully give you an answer, or bring you up on stage and you can you can ask the question yourself. All right, uh, getting to uh, this week in blockchain. A uh, couple of things have happened. Interesting, March 20th, uh, which was just a couple of days ago, the, the uh, U.S. Department of the Treasury uh, published five tips for building blockchain projects. Now, last week we had the Senate meeting on blockchain, and it turned out to be a little bit of a rudimentary kind of get-to-know blockchain for the senators and the members of the House. Not much really discussed of any substance, but we're starting to see some things come out with the SEC that give us some good direction. Uh, and the Department of the Treasury, it, it, it indicates that they're thinking about things, they're thinking about things in the right way, uh, and my hat is off to them. But uh, after months of tinkering with distributed ledger, the first and, and, and most important insight offered is for people to ask themselves, is blockchain technology a good fit for this concept? This is from the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and I kind of agree with them, I, I hate to say. Uh, these are some of the questions the Treasury recommends to determine if blockchain technology is central to the project. Number one, do you need a, a structured central repository for information? You gotta have that. Uh, is there more than one entity reading or writing transactions to the database? Of course. Uh, is there less than total trust between the parties, entities in the ecosystem? For example, one user will not accept the truth as reported by another user. Are there central gatekeepers introducing costs and or friction when verifying transactions? For example, mutual verification, agents, brokers, that kind of thing. Um, are there routine or logical interactions that occur between, uh, that can be programmed to self-execute? Uh, example, smart contracts. So uh, everyone's thinking about this thing called distributed ledger and how it's going to impact businesses, how it's going to work inside of a business environment. Uh, and one thing as people that work in the space know, if we can't look at something and say, look, it's going to happen, uh, the transaction is going to happen a thousand times faster and it's going to be a hundred times less expensive to conduct that transaction then we're probably gonna move on to something else because there's so many things out there that kind of qualify for that. Um, I'm gonna say that again, a thousand times faster, a hundred times less expensive. If someone in your industry uh, moves on to distributed ledger and on to blockchain technology, they conduct transactions a thousand times quicker and a hundred times less expensive, it's gonna to be tough to compete with them. So 
2018 is going to be an interesting year. 2019 is even going to be more interesting as a lot of the projects that we're up um, that are ongoing begin to unfold and become live. It's going to be great. Um, the truth about blockchain. Uh, this is actually from the Harvard Business Review. Contracts, transactions, and the records of them are among the defining structures of our economic, legal, and political systems. Absolutely. Everything we do is revolved around transactions and contracts. They protect assets and set organizational boundaries. They establish and verify identities and chronicle events. They govern interactions among nations, organizations, communities, and individuals. They guide managerial and social action. And yet these critical tools and the bureaucracies formed to manage them have not kept up with the economy's digital transformation. They are like a rush hour gridlock trapping a Formula One race car. In a digital world, the way we regulate and maintain administrative control has to change, and it will change. Anything that can be decentralized will become decentralized. Blockchain promises to solve this problem, a technology at the heart of the Bitcoin and other virtual currencies. Blockchain is an open distributed ledger that can record transactions between two parties effectively and verifiably and permanent in a permanent way. The ledger itself can also be programmed to trigger transactions automatically. So this is what we're talking about, the, the coming change that's happening. Things um, are going to start happening here very swiftly, I would imagine, in the next two or three months. I'm finishing up on my first project within about the next 90 days. We'll have some press releases. I've got two projects coming uh, behind that. And I'm not the only one with projects that were coming to, uh, to fruition here. So when we start doing these press releases, people start understanding what uh, we're doing. It's going to be very interesting. Um, we've got some other things that are coming up. Motley Fool on what is blockchain and all this kind of stuff. Things are heating up over the last week in the blockchain world, even though uh, cryptocurrencies seem to be losing value in the speculative market. Uh, Bitcoin is down, Ethereum is down, but it's up overall. I mean, if you bought a, a Ethereum a year ago, you'd still be up as far as that's concerned. Certainly if you bought Ethereum or Bitcoin back in, in uh, 2014, you'd still be up as far as your value is concerned. So it, is it a good investment? I I don't know. I'm, I'm I, I, I'm a miner, so I do own coin, um, but I, I don't take place in, or part in the speculation. That's just the way it is. Anyway, uh, that's kind of what uh, uh, my, my view of blockchain uh, this week and some of the things that have happened. And my opinion and 50 cents will buy you half a cup of coffee at Denny's. So just keep that in mind. Um, I hope you get all the, all the value and, and half a cup of coffee. Um, we have an interesting guest today uh, with Doc Launch. Doc Launch, Michael Anton Adam. Thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure, man. My pleasure. Great to see you. Great to and see you. As well. um, good to we, uh, well, yeah, good to finally be on the show. It is. I apologize. There is a bit of a waiting line that we have um, people circling around trying to get on it. It's an interesting show. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I kind of fumble around and kind of, you know, uh, I, I am not professional. <laughs> and, and this is a live event. The weekly blockchain update. It's, it's great. <laughs> Thanks for having, you, for having you. I want to talk a little bit, Michael, about you first. Uh, can right. you tell us a little bit about what you've done and some of the things you've done before blockchain and and then kind of give us a segue into what led you to become involved in blockchain, start teaching blockchain where you teach and, and some of that kind of stuff. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after grad school, my, my career really began in banking. So I was a, a commercial lender and an analyst basically my entire professional career until I started getting back into technology. Um, so I started off um, going through a, a year-long intensive credit training program at a large national bank uh, here in the Midwest. And that was great. It really taught me about the underlying um, uh, issues as far as credit goes and, and, and what you need to actually look at different types of, of, of lending opportunities. Um, and then about five years ago, I was a commercial lender in Madison, Wisconsin. 
And as you know, Madison has a very robust uh, medical technology uh, atmosphere right now with uh, being the headquarters of Epic Systems. Uh, there's been a lot of healthcare um, IT companies spinning off of that. So I had the rare opportunity to leave over a decade of banking and go work for a um, healthcare IT company as their interim CFO. And for me, that was, was really uh, kind of interesting because, you know, I said, hey guys, I don't know if I'm really a CFO. Accounting was never really my, my strong suit, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come on and, and help you with what you need. And that, that point was, how can we, you know, get the capital we need to, to grow this tech product? So after 10 years of wearing a suit and tie every day to work, I walked into the IT company, started wearing flip-flops and uh, t-shirts every day and really <laughs> fell in love with my wardrobe change. And um, that's where I had the, uh, you know, my first couple FinTech ideas. So, um, you know, five years ago is kind of where it all started. And then in 2015, we launched Doc Launch, which, um, you know, is a live product. This is not a pilot. This is not beta. Um, it's it's out there in the market, and um, it's uh, we're really proud of what, what, what we've created. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And you also teach, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, with building Doc Launch, and I can get into a little bit more what that is here in a, in a bit, but. <clears throat> You know, we really dove in deep in the blockchain blockchain world. Uh, we were approached by several outside parties saying, hey, we're really interested in blockchain as well. So that's where I really immerse myself, my team immerse ourselves into blockchain outside of the cryptocurrency space. Because um, obviously they're totally two different worlds. So just immersing ourselves in, in blockchain application outside of crypto. And that, you know, kind of snowballed into... Uh, different speaking engagements. Um, so now I actually teach uh, blockchain technology at Marquette University um, in their AIM program, which is their Applied Investment Management program. Uh, I also teach um, blockchain in the, um, uh, the uh, commercial banking program as well. So it's really blockchain uh, 101 and, and blockchain and financial services. Um, so that's it's been a great experience. Um, Marquette University also has launched a blockchain lab which has been uh, great to work with those students as well. Um, anything from ICO, utility token offerings, just coming up with new um, blockchain ideas or software as a service or even hardware solutions for blockchain, just kind of building that ecosystem within the university uh, so the kids can, can get their hands dirty and work with professionals like myself, attorneys, um, people from other large institutions from around Milwaukee and the Midwest. Great. So you're, you're, you're bringing in professionals and, and having them speak and do that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's speaking engagements. Um, Milwaukee just hosted the first, uh, Milwaukee blockchain conference, which was at, which was at Marquette. Um, really good attendance, people from all over the Midwest, um, actually some people from all over the United States actually. So, uh, it was always good to, to increase that community here. I think Milwaukee in itself has a really unique opportunity to become, um, you know, a fintech hub uh, and then integrate some blockchain with that. I mean, we have, you know, Fiserv is here in Milwaukee and Northwestern Mutual, and we have some pretty big um, powerhouses in the financial service industry. And I think here in 2018 and 2019, you're going to see a lot of emerging uh, fintech and blockchain companies here out of out of the MKE. It, it, it's an exciting time to be in blockchain. Yeah, I think 2018, 2019 is just going to be uh, be off the charts. Um, I, I wanted to back up just a little bit because you did mention a couple of things uh, about the difference between crypto and blockchain. And I think that um, uh, it might be interesting just to talk a little bit about what your feelings are and what you see as the differences there. Uh, you're, you're a teacher. You're involved in fin fintech. You're involved in blockchain. You're involved in, in financial blockchain. You're involved in medical blockchain, too. I want to we want to get to that, too, before the hour is up. But uh, uh, so uh, give us uh, just briefly your ideas and, and, and summations as far as the differences between crypto and blockchain and, and how that features into uh, uh, the curriculum and, 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 and what you see the future as. Yeah, right. So <laughs> my first, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm, you know, either speaking or on a panel, I always bring up a clip and it's from 1996. I don't have it here, but I think it's a Today Show. 
and it's when they're talking about email. What is email or what is the internet anyways? And we really don't, and everybody's like, well, what's, what's that What's that symbol with the A and the circle around it? Is it about, what, do, what, what does it mean? So that's, to me, I think that's just a perfect example of where we are with, with blockchain today. So um, if you think about, you know, back to 1995 when the internet came out, email was basically the first real application of internet. That's what I use first, that's what you use first, that's what probably everybody <laughs> on here, will, depending their age, use first. Um, and now, now look at everything we have. You know, we have the Internet of Things, and we have so many things, e-commerce, um, Amazon, everything that has come from the Internet. So my thoughts is really crypto is, is basically the email of, of blockchain. It's the first application <laughs> that was widely accepted um, on, on the kind of the railroad of blockchain. So... There are so many more things that are going to come, and so so much more possibility. And you know, luckily, crypto came first because it was a truly um, unique opportunity to have you know a real distributed ledger, uh, public distri distributed ledger. Um, so, I mean, that's really I think where the difference is is that crypto was was the first use case and the first you know successful so far use case of, of uh, blockchain technology and. Now you're just going to see more and more things come like you have on the internet with all the, the tools that have come from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the way that I look at it sometimes is uh, uh, Bitcoin was the internet of value. I mean, first we had the internet 20 years, then the, uh, the internet of things about eight years, um, uh, uh, you know, and that, and that was, you know, someone walked up to you and said, look, your, your, your refrigerator is going to call Amazon when you're out of milk and have it delivered to you and everyone laughed, right? And okay. about eight years later, you walked into Home Depot and there was a Samsung refrigerator with a, you know, a touch screen on there where you could hook up Amazon and when you're out of milk, they would deliver you milk, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's happened. So that was the internet of things. So we had the internet of data. That was about five years. It's happened so quickly, um, but we have everyone's hashed. We know what everyone is doing. We know your buying habits. Um, you don't believe me go to google type in beagle puppies and then go to facebook and all of a sudden you'll see beagle puppies on the on the sidebar we understand who you are we understand what you're what you're browsing what you're looking at that's the internet of data about five years uh the internet of value or the internet of, uh, of value where we could transfer value on the internet is what we look at as far as bitcoin is concerned it started in 2008 with uh, the crypto punks, uh, but really kind of went follow. And really, when it first when it really came out and started gaining popularity, it was only three or four years. I really boom started to really get in there. Now we're entering into the next internet, and that's the internet of trust, and that's basically the Ethereum based ERC20 tokenization and how we can now transfer trust on the internet it gives uh coins and crypto uh and if this then that type of an argument so if something happens we can actually ex execute something and execute it autonomously uh and execute it uh based on a on a given set of rules without it with any intervention so it's the internet of trust that we're that we're in now what's coming next i have no idea i i I, I was the one that, you know, when they, they said email and ARPNET, it was ARPNET back then. And yes, I did have a 350 baud modem that, you know, screeched and, and scrawled. And, but I was one that first, I didn't really understand why everyone wanted to be connected like this and where it would go. And I think I'm kind of, you know, in that same, same area there with the, the next internet, whatever is coming after this. I got no idea. And I don't think anyone does. But it's going to be exciting. I'll tell you that much. 2018, 2019 is going to rock. So that yeah, kind I mean, of brings up. Go ahead. Oh yeah, Sam. That's you know, you know, what's next? That's one of the things we really focus on at Doc Launch is how do we take this this massive thing that is blockchain because it is truly massive. I mean, it could affect us in so many ways. How do we take this huge thing that's blockchain and hyper focus it into uh, real world solutions now for enterprise customers across the world? So. How do we um, identify use cases within those companies and how do we use our technology to then um, improve their internal efficiencies, but then also if they want, 
uh, to step it up a notch, use blockchain to, um, to kick it up a gear. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a great segue into Doc Launch. And I want to get there, but uh, we do have one question. Um, yeah. And it's more appropriate uh, to do it now. So let me publish this question. Um, what are the three most unneeded uses of blockchain? Example, example to encrypt, even though you don't need a chain to encrypt. So Dan's asking some questions. Maybe you want to attack that uh, coming from a academic perspective. Yeah, I mean, inefficient is you could use, or maybe redundancies. What are some redundancies? So if we're talking about you know encryption versus decryption, you know technically there is no such thing as encryption or decryption within blockchain. Um, so, but, you know, I mean, we could, we could rattle off some inefficiencies, but I think what's important to remember is blockchain is at such a young age outside of crypto that there are going to be some inefficiencies and some redundancies until we grow it enough to scale it. Um, you know, one example is, is obviously all the private ledgers we're going to be creating, right? So, I mean, is that really blockchain if it's a private ledger? I, is it? Uh, yes, it can be. It's not. In theory, it is not supposed to, or it doesn't fall into the attributes. But, um, you know, there are some redundant redundancies, and we're going to be bending the rules a little bit. But um, I think that's needed to build the foundation and, and get it to scale. Um, because not everything is this, like, utopian world of cryptocurrency where it can just be truly open um, when it comes to uh, other blockchain applications, whether it's healthcare, financial services, um, insurance, we're really going to have to, we're going to have to create a few inefficiencies or redundancies in the beginning to kind of get to where we want to go and scale it that way. Right, right, right. And, and I think that, I think in the, in the uh, you know, uh, doing, uh, working with companies in distributed ledger and rationalizing workflows, one of the things that I notice is that we have a uh, we have a, a a contract or a decision that's made, and then there's four or five people in the middle, and then there's the the execution, right? And then a lot yeah. of times we we can go from here all the way to here that fast without these people in the middle. And yeah, it might be inefficient in some ways, but a lot of times that becomes a devil you know argument mm -hmm. when you look at exactly what is taking place right now and all the different people that are involved in making the decision and transferring the trust so that that uh, contract can get executed where with distributed ledger yeah we might have miners we might have this we might have encryption there might be inefficiencies but when you take a look at the job that it's performing it's much more effect effective than the than the current status quo that we've been doing because someone told us, right? Right. right. So no, that's it. A absolutely. Thank thanks for the question and thanks for answering. And I want to get on to without further ado, because it's already, you know, it's already our hour is already halfway gone. It's amazing how quickly this goes. Yeah. So I want to get on to uh, to Doc Launch and start talking about Doc Launch and uh, talking about fintech, how that fits in. Uh, let's get some examples going and let's save some time to actually talk about healthcare. And anyone that has questions, please feel free to chime in. Right. Go ahead. So, I mean, at its core is um, the software as a service program that we've built. Um, it basically um, is a documentation management and workflow uh, management system. Um, so, there are three aspects to it there's the enterprise portal which organizations um, around the globe can use internally with their administrators, whoever is going to be using it. There's uh, mobile applications for um, kind of that uh, B2C for that consumer to, to use with that organization. And then there's a B2B aspect as well where enterprise and enterprise companies can talk with each other. Um, multiple, 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 creating their own chain down down that kind of relationship. Um, the platform uh, is, is really the hub for somebody at that company to be on all day. Uh, they can uh, collect and exchange documents, collect uh, electronic signatures. They can have documents executed um, all electronically. Uh, everything flows through our system. Nothing is ever sent via email or 
um, any other fax or scans. Um, it really gives a consumer the ability to execute any type of contract they want mobily or on their desktop laptop. Um, it allows um, our enterprise users to then see those documents that have been executed, make sure that you know they have that their customers have fulfilled all the steps that need to be filled. Um, uh, also, you know, built-in CRM system. But but really, uh, what we focus on is. How do we really, really, really maximize the efficiencies of, of the workflow, uh, whether it's in a financial institution, an insurance company, um, a healthcare company, a technology company? We work with a lot of different types of companies, but it's really let's manage your workflow, workflow process, your documentation process. Um, we also have payment capabilities in there as well. You can send an invoice through the system, collect payments through the system. So it's really just a super nice streamlined way for any organization, whether you're, you know, less than a million dollars a year up to billions of dollars to manage your entire, entire workflow. So, um, th let's talk about underwriting, right? Everyone knows what underwriting is right? and the document flow that's involved there. Um, we see, you know, the future coming where, um, you know, I, I think I can say this. I, uh, uh in, in the state of Arizona, it is appropriate or it's legal to uh, a, con, a, a signature on a blockchain is legal and binding in the state of Arizona. And I've talked with, uh, with a congressman who's been involved in a lot of this uh, legislation in Arizona. And I asked him a poignant question. I said, look, can we transfer a piece of property to a blockchain and have the blockchain owner own that property? He said, yes, you can. So. That kind of opens up a big can of worms. We don't need a, a, an Alta policy ever again for that piece of property because ownership is tracked on the distributed ledger, and we can even do fractional ownership on a on a uh, on a commercial property or something of this nature. Lots of things we can do now. Now, right. one of the things that stands in the way is yes, we can track ownership on the distributed ledger and a signature on the distributed ledger is legal and binding in the state of Arizona, but we still need to have closings. We still need to have all this kind of, of stuff that happens. You, you, you follow me where I'm going on this. I can tell yeah. you're chomping at absolutely. the bit. I'm going to let you go, man. Go, go, go. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, obviously you're bringing up uh, the title industry and that's going to be one of the first to be affected. So we take a lot of calls from title companies um, and you know, it's a perfect, uh, you know, example of an intermediary that's there and what purpose do they really serve if blockchain can, can pass them. It's, you know, it's one of the really lowest hanging fruits um, that, you know, we're seeing that, you know, that may be affected. So, um, absolutely. So it's, you know, in Illinois right now, in Cook County, um, they're working on um, the Register of Deeds with um, Jennifer O'Rourke is the liaison for um, Illinois and blockchain. So they're doing some great stuff there. They have a white paper uh, online if you guys want to read that. Some really interesting things about putting property and deeds on blockchain. Um, absolutely. And when, you, when you're looking at financial institutions and, um, you know, organizations within a state, plus you know, state government, absolutely there's applications for blockchain for the finance company to use it and then just talk directly to, to that state organization to record those records. Um, I think it's going to be one of the first things that happen um, that we see kind of, you know, spread quickly. Um, I mean, you can bet that, you know, people at R3 and these large banking consortiums are already looking into that because they all have mortgage products as well. Uh, I bet you Fannie and Freddie are looking in it, into it as well. So it's, um, we get calls from from uh, title companies all the time, and what I tell them is, you need to have somebody in your team that's that's dedicated to blockchain and, and what's what's coming on board. And you know, you can survive it. You just have to figure out you know how your title company can use blockchain to kind of get ahead of everybody else. Yeah, if 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 your competition is doing transactions a thousand times quicker and a hundred times less expensive, you need to adapt. That's for sure. And it's good that they're giving you calls, they're reaching out to you. So kind of give us some sort of an idea about, walk us through how you would interface. I am a company that's in real estate. 
Um, I have my blockchain guy that is on. Uh, we have um, we've minted a coin. Uh, we have a workflow that's been rationalized. We uh, we have the workflow rationalized. We're understanding. We have our, our data points. We know our collection points. But our problem is, and this is where a, a, a lot of a lot of a lot of folks are at this point now, where they're trying to execute. Right? It's past the point where they're thinking about it. Yeah, they're actually trying to execute, and they're running into situations where you have to interface with human beings and get. Uh, things like signatures and authorizations and things like this, the things to move forward. Right. So right, right, right. answer some questions about, how, you know, how would that look and, and uh, what does that look like? How do we get that, that piece done? Yeah. So what I would say to that is whether you're, um, like you mentioned, the title company or your insurance or healthcare or any type of organization, um, first, I would, I would say you're never solving really the problem you're not solving for the problem of blockchain, right? You're not saying like, oh, I'm company ABC and I, I really need to solve for that problem of blockchain because you don't really have a problem of blockchain right now. You have a problem of inefficiencies within your core processes that you do on a daily basis. Um, so basically identifying what core processes are pr really inefficient for you right now and then creating several use cases and then saying, okay, now how could blockchain really help support this problem or make this problem less of a problem or completely eliminate this problem. Um, so a lot of things you mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, do you require the trust of somebody else in your daily business? Do you require contracts in your daily business? Do you require like servicing of those contracts in your daily business? Is there an if this, then that type of scenario? And like, for example, in a financial institution, that could be something, um, you know, it's very easy or complicated as a loan covenant. So if you're taking out a $10 million commercial loan and there's obviously covenants uh, in place that say you can't, you know, go below this uh, ratio, you can't go above this ratio. And if there's some dramatic change in ownership, um, that's a no-no as well. Um, so I think when companies are looking to identify, you know, how they can use blockchain technology, it's, it's really how do we, what are our, what's inefficient in our core processes and how can we make those better? And then how can blockchain technology make those really, really better? You know, I, I was in private equity for 30 years. We looked at a lot of deals and we kind of, we kind of set up these things that would, would standardize um, uh, and, and questions to look at, right? If they qualify, then, then we'll move forward. Uh, and, and, and I've done that with, with, um, uh, with distributed ledger. You know, I look at deals. I have deal flow coming in, people asking all the time, Hey, look, we have this idea for a company about distributed ledger. First thing I ask is, okay, is there a transfer of trust? Because that's really what, what we're doing, right? We're transferring trust. If we look at the workflows and there's transfer of trust, then we'll move forward. Uh, next thing I look at is there's sticky bits, people that uh, are trying, that disagree with the quality or disagree with, uh, with the deal after it's done and want to want to go back in and grind, do the salami method and deal method. Uh, sometimes we call the, and there's, there's people in there called, uh, brokers and agents and these kinds of people that are in, in the process, right? Uh, if they're in the process, then yeah, let's move forward. Um, uh, the third thing is, is there money in the transaction? Because if there's no money in the transaction, we really don't need to, to rationalize it. Um, uh, and the, th the fourth thing is, uh, will this make it quicker? Because the first rule of growth hacking is make it quicker or someone else will. And that's basically what we're doing here is we're, we're growth hacking and, and, um, accelerating growth uh, on companies so yeah that's that's totally appropriate when we start looking at workflows kind of look at look at lens it through these kinds of lenses and then start uh, start moving forward yeah absolutely I mean when yeah, we talk about, speed, we'll talk about speed, if you think about the think financial, about service, financial services, services. Um, um, talk about I see know your customer so how long does it actually take you to identify that this person is who they say that they are um, and that process is getting a little bit easier uh, without blockchain in the financial services market, but it's still, um, you know, a process. Um, and it's something that has to, you know, to keep on top of every single year, whether it's with updating signature cards or doing any type of renewal service. So um, absolutely, I mean, with the you know, creation of digital identities, that's just going to take that process and that KYC, um, you know, to a totally different place.
Why, why do we have signature cards? Uh, I don't know. I think you might still have them. It depends on the thing there. <laughs> I mean, That's kind of, we're, we're trying to solve for that problem at Doc Launch, so you can just. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. There's a, there's a good there's a good solution. Uh, let's let's get that done. Can you can you get that done as soon as possible? Because um, it's a pain in the butt, right? And no one looks at signatures anymore. Uh, right. Well, you know. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, banks are financial institutions are usually not the first adopters of new technology. Um, you know, that's why a lot of the banks and financial institutions we work with, we they're not even really interested in our blockchain technology. They're interested in our software solution because it solves really big problems that they have. Um, but then it's kind of a starter kit. We can introduce them into, you know, what we can do for them in blockchain, how it will improve their processes. So it's, um, you know, people that work with us, they don't have to have a blockchain solution if they use us, but we can help them use it if they'd like to. So yeah, and and you know uh, from the uh, from the truth about blockchain um, article on the Harvard Business Review, uh, these critical tools and bureaucracies formed to manage them have not kept up with the economy's digital transformation. They're like a rush hour gridlock trapping Formula One race car. Uh, that this is this is what's happened across the board. Um, we we have signature cards. We have all these things that really have. We, we do them because someone told them to do them and they told us to do them because someone told them to do them. And we don't know if it's relevant anymore in our workflows. And a lot of times we haven't had the intelligence to sit down and take a look at the workflows and, and rationalize them. Uh, someone's going to be doing this work and it might as well be us. So what you did kind of hint a little bit about it. Let's dive down deep into doc launch and uh, how you can interface with the, the the problems of the blockchain now let's get back into the where we have a blockchain we have someone who's actually implementing blockchain technology and and now we have paperwork we have things that that need to be need to be done in real person as opposed to on the, on the blockchain to get this thing started or to uh, know your customer things of this nature so docu launch is a way that we can collect that information and interface through an api to the distributed ledger and do it easily is that correct yeah, right. So there's two, you know, really main aspects. One is the creation of digital identities. So whether that's um, digital identities of your customers that will be created by them using a Doc Launch mobile app. So there's digital identities, and then there's also um, thumbs up. <laughs> and there's also uh, the uh, thumbprint, yeah. digital identity on a device. Uh, right, right, right. Thumbprint, um, iris you know, scan. Right, exactly. There's, um, you know, facial recognition applications out there as well. That can all be integrated uh, depending on what your organization needs it does. Um, but then also, obviously, smart contracts. So, what are we, what are we collecting uh, through Doc Launch? We're collecting documents that sometimes turn into contracts. So it's being able to then hash those documents or hash those contracts, um, pair them with a digital identity. Uh, and then build a robust chain that way. Um, and, and every company wants to use it differently. So uh, if you talk about, you know, obviously there, there's that aspect of ownership and contract, but then there's also, you know, for a financial institution, the ability to track assets over time. Um, I have a loan. I bought um, 40 pieces of, you know, small capital equipment, and I want to track those assets over time of its lifetime. Uh, maybe even calculate some type of depreciation schedules off of those assets. Um, I'm a financial institution, and I uh, I'm big into floor, floor plan floor, uh, floor plan loans. Uh, for those of you who don't know that what that is, that's uh, lending money on for auto dealerships to buy a ton of cars for manufacturers, um, tracking those type of assets as well. Um, you know, when we talk about medical, again, it's creating a digital identity for the individual. So me having my own digital identity and having my re medical records um, out there. So, you know, I think we're, you know, depending on what, how you want to use blockchain, there's a way you can use it. Um, you know, the first question was, is it, is it the best use for you? Maybe not, maybe you don't really need it for that, but um, you know, every organization wants to try it at their own speed and at their own rate. 
Um, the companies that are going to kind of leapfrog the companies are the ones that are going to recognize, okay, we're going to use this to really become more efficient. Some companies are going to try to use it just to say they use it. Um, so um, again, it's how you how you identify uh, what you want to use and is it you know the most efficient use of your time. Uh, we do have a question. I want to publish it, uh, and this comes from John Crockett, who is our. By the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna warn you, uh, John is our, our our resident crypto anarchist. So okay, there you go. so here you go. Uh, John's uh, question is. Um, Wondering where you see AI being used in blockchain and in doc launch or otherwise. So let's yeah, talk a little um, bit about artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, AI obviously, it's you can't have one without the other, right? They they connect blockchain and AI. You can, I mean, they're two separate things, but you can put them together. You know, in our world, what I'm seeing now, especially in financial services, is AI using in um, automated underwriting, decision making, um, automated uh, loan execution, loan funding. So uh, no longer are the days where you go to your bank, you have to fill out a personal financial statement on their bank's letterhead, and then you have to um, you know, fill out a paper loan application uh, because they don't take the loan applications online because of Reg B, which says any loan application that comes through, they have to legally underwrite. It costs them just as much to underwrite a five thousand dollar loan application as a fifty million dollar loan application, believe it or not. So uh, I think you'll see AI play a really big role in speeding up um, and verifying data. So whether that's you know verifying a person, verifying credit score, verifying financial um, statements, uh, that's where I see um, a lot of it connecting um, in, in the world that we live in at Doc Launch. Yeah, a AI is a big data play, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, I, wish, it's, I, wish I, I wish I was a hardware guy because I'm I'm not I'm a I'm a software guy and hardware is just so much cooler and sexier. So I I wish I had could answer those questions, but I can't. Uh, well, you know, I I don't think that hardware guys are necessarily cooler or sexier. That's for sure. Um, um, so I'm just saying the actual things that are being created. I mean, if you think about like the company in Scandinavia that's making like the soda, soda can sized, um, basically little bots that go into shipping containers that track, um, you know, the entire logistics, um, import export and hook that up to blockchain and have real time payments when that soda can crosses a certain place or, you know, the temperature drops below something else and deduct some type of payment. I mean, there's some pretty cool hardware stuff going on right now. Yeah, there, uh, yeah. And um, let's see, our, our, our local crypto, and this is nothing sexier than software uh, coming for, uh, as, 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 so, so there's a programmer for you there, right? Um, All right, well, uh, I'll, 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 I'll retract my statement, I agree, because I'm a software guy. <laughs> But, you know, as it turns out, you know, uh, artificial intelligence is not really artificial intelligence at this point. It's just a data play. The more data you have, the the, the more you can do and, and you can get into uh, semantic latent indexing and you, know, you can get in 50 words on a, a semantic latent, latent indexing and really understand what's going on. There's a lot of things that we can do if we have enough data. The problem is collecting that data in an intelligent manner, right? Because a lot of times we have people that uh, uh, give results and they're called managers and managers want to game the system so that they look better, right? So the reported results that they have are going to be different than really what the truth was. And what, then we have garbage in and garbage out. We have all kinds of systems that we developed, uh, uh, reporting systems. We have publicly traded companies that uh, have reported uh, financial uh, instruments that they report on a, a quarterly basis that we know are many times fiction in, in some fit, form, or function. Um, uh, uh, lots of different types of reporting mechanisms in, in a reporting of agriculture, for instance, where all the data that the USDA has is reported data uh, coming from the growers. Uh, so they game the system and garbage in, garbage out. So we... Right. Uh, Artificial intelligence right now, based on that data set, not going to be that that correct, right? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, data building in and feeding into AI is, is something that, you know, we have to keep our eyes on and see who who has so much data and how are they using it. I mean, I, I met with one of the heads of, um, of commercial light or business banking for one of the country's largest regional banks about two weeks ago, and he's already seeing some of his customers getting taken out by Amazon. Because Amazon now, you know, has a charter. And um, they're able to predict that you're so and so business owner. We're going to just send you an approval for a three hundred thousand dollar line of credit. So um, because we know your buying patterns, we know you know what you're purchasing on through Amazon. We know you know what your credit's going to be. So it's it's interesting. There's definitely a lot of play there. The the Internet of Data. We know who you are, what you buy. Right. We exactly. Want, we, want to, we want to facilitate you buying more of it. So. Yeah. Um, right. You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the data stream and, and accurate data stream. We always talk about IoT and Internet of Things that gives us a data stream that's reported directly from the source with no intermediary right directly to the to the blockchain. Um, and that's something that Doc, uh, uh, Doc Launch could help out with. I mean, do you do those types of projects? Let's talk about specific projects here as we, by the way, approach the top of the hour. Yeah, I mean, IoT is interesting. I think if it's truly an e-commerce um, solution you're looking for, Doc Launch may not be the best thing because, I mean, basically, that's what's interesting about IoT and e-commerce is that's a, a, another another example of where blockchain can really be a true blockchain early because you can really have a distributed ledger. I think if it's a simple like, e-commerce um, type of relationship, I'm buying it. You're selling it. I'm paying for it. Here's ownership. I think that's going to be, you know, pretty easy or not easy, but it's going to be one of the first things we see. Um, you know, the things that we concentrate on more is financial service, insurance, healthcare. There's so much records and information changing that need to be collected or signed or verified. Um, how do we how do we help those institutions collect that information? Um, now, again, that's not really Internet of Things, but um, that's really what we're focusing on is, you know, those larger enterprise customers or those, you know, mid-market customers. How can we um, improve those efficiencies? Well, it, it, it's a segue into healthcare, right? Uh, uh, if you're doing healthcare on the blockchain, you're going to want to be collecting data in real time. Right. You're going to want to know that it, that insulin pump is working. You're going to want to know that there's, you know, 50 some odd devices in this in this patient's room. Right. right. And you're going to want to know where those things are going and what's happening. You, know, you, you, you have a, a you have a emergency medical technicians uh, that arrive and a patient is having a seizure, for instance. Right. We know that that there's a certain percentage of the time that that med emergency medical technician is going to make a correct judgment. Um, and there's a certain uh, amount of time that he's going to make an incorrect judgment. And uh, the reason is, is that he doesn't have all the information that he needs. Uh, there's information that exists uh, at the primary care physician's office, uh, you know, and sometimes that isn't even on a computer. It's in a file folder, right? And that information is sitting on the primary care physician's uh, computer. And at night, it's shut off. No one can access that data. You've got another data set that exists in the uh, insurance company, and the insurance company has all this data about what, what has happened to this patient. You have another um, uh, set of data that's sitting in an uh, uh, emergency room in a hospital where the patient presented themselves a year and a half ago and had a certain type of an event. And then you have two or three different types of data that exist in local hospitals where this patient has presented and had these types of events. Uh, if the emergency medical technician had access to all that information, he, you know, he, he could walk up to the patient, hold his arm out, scan a QR code and understand the patient's history. If we had it on a right. blockchain, right. And, right. and, and we could it, collect that through yeah, DocuLog. But, that's the answer, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's so much that blockchain can impact in, in medical and you touched upon some of it. So some of it's medical records, right? So, um, where have I been? Who am I? For me, that's actually a really uh, important use case for me that we actually work on at Doc Launch is I've lived in, I don't know how many, like seven cities over the last 
15 years and I've had a, you know, a different doctor in every city and I don't even know where my healthcare records are anymore. So every time I go to a doctor, I'm like, I don't know. Somebody told me seven years ago that I was allergic to penicillin. And I'm pretty sure I said I'm allergic to penicillin, but I, I haven't taken it. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, medical records, um, that's something that we definitely work with on Doc Launch uh, as well. Uh, giving the records back to the individual and also distributed through insurance companies, uh, finance, or, um, hospitals, doctor's offices. Then you also mentioned some, you know, using blockchain and, and some type of equipment and hardware. I mean, God, when you think about, you know, blockchain, it also establishes establishes as an audit trail, right? So if you think right. about, you think about, okay, an, an, an anesthesiologist is using machines and using drugs in those machines, and there's a certain amount of dosage that they have to give, and there's a certain protocol. Now, now you're establishing some type of um, backlog or, or um, or auditing system of, of what that what that process was. Then you go ahead and you link that to that individual doctor's insurance company for malpractice insurance. So I mean, there's all these synergies there that can get connected together. Another one we like to think about is you know the, the insane opioid academic epidemic we have here in the United States and you know around the world. And uh, God, prescription drug use. I mean, try to use blockchain to to stop drug seeking behavior. Um, you know. You have your digital identity, unless you're unless you're a master of just creating new digital identities for yourself. If you are, awesome, good job. Um, you know, it's you can really um, right. You can really you can really uh, you know monitor you know that type of scenario. So you know, patient records is something that we work with closely. But the stuff that I'm really interested in is is that kind of chain effect. You know, an anesthesiologist to his processes to malpractice insurance. You know, and down the line, I mean, there's just so many things that are that are interconnected that, you know, that's what we really need to think about in blockchain is we tend to think about it in industries, but industries just don't work with that industry. Industry works with every industry. So every industry has insurance. No matter what you do, you have to have some type of insurance. Um, so there's going to be some cost of there. You know, so, I mean, God, there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of use cases that are really interesting. It's going to be an interesting 2008, 18, and 2019. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, I have a problem every time I wake up in the morning figuring out who I am and, and where I'm at, uh, much less, uh, you know, figuring, <laughs> figuring out, um, you know, wh where my uh, vaccinations were and, and all this kind of stuff that, uh, uh, that, that's happening. So it's going to be very interesting. And um, I got some bad news. It's the top of the hour, and there you go. We've... Uh, We've wasted another perfectly good hour uh, talking about all things blockchain. Very interesting conversation today, Michael. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, your your patience in getting on board and, and getting in. Um, really uh, appreciate some of the comments and some of the things you're doing at Doc Launch. Um, I do have a, a couple of uh, clients that uh, I'm going to be reaching out to you probably in the next couple of weeks, talking a little bit about how we can uh, use Doc Launch to... Uh, uh, to create some of the, the paperwork that we need to have uh, while it's transferred onto the uh, distributed ledger and the, and the APIs that you use. Want to dive down a little bit more into that. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Michael Lacus, I want to thank you. I want to thank Shindig um, uh, for providing this uh, awesome, awesome environment for us. Mike, if you're there, can you pop up your, uh, your name and your number? Oh, there he is. He's coming on board. Hey, I'll Mike. just pop up my head. I'll pop up my head instead, because um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I put the slide in in this event for this time. But yeah, um, if anyone's interested in uh, looking at Shindig, uh, Mike at shindigevents.com dot com and six four six eight nine six one seven four seven. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, and uh, um, you know, I just had a quick question for Michael. Why I got you up here? We I know we're a little bit over time, but it's quick. You know, I've noticed. You know, having worked in financial services that they seem to be looking at, you know, financial services are known to be slow to adopt new technologies, new things pretty slowly. But I see at least, especially on like the main brokerage firms and all that, they all have blockchain um, departments now. And you think that's indicative of just, you know, how important it is to that sector? Yeah, I think it is important, indicative of how important it is. Um, but I also think, you know, those brokerage firms and other financial service companies are starting to realize that one of the reasons that they have been slow to adopt 
it's because of compliance and regulation, right? So right. one of the reasons it's slow moving industries because there's so much regulation and there's so much compliance changing all the time. Um, but good news, the compliance and the auditors and regulators love blockchain too. So if you listen to any of the, you know, statements from the OCC, um, or any of these, um, you know, the FDIC or any of these regulating entities, they're really in favor of blockchain because then they can actually not have to go in and send in auditors for months and months at a time. They can see things faster and more transparent. So I think it's going to be, um, you know, a really symbiotic relationship where as these regulated entities start to push for blockchain, um, these financial services will actually be able to speed up the processes a lot, lot more because, you know, that kind of compliance and regulations has what's been holding it back. So, you know, the, the government, I think, is, you know, especially like in that area, is, is, is really doing a good job of being pro-blockchain as far as, because they, they want to be able to audit you quickly, too. They want to play Big Brother easier. Right. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yep. Uh, if the days of proprietary databases um, are going to go the wayside, if if there is uh, someone who has a proprietary database, they're hiding their data, they're they're, they're doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, someone enters the industry and they do things a thousand times quicker and a hundred times less expensive. You can't compete. So that's that's where it's going. Mike, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate Shindig. Really appreciate the opportunity to get on here. Um, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, and Mike. It's kind of, it's kind of confusing today. I don't know, but uh, uh, Mike or Michael or uh, Adam. There you go, Adam. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate Doc Lunch. Uh, we're going to be uh, chatting, no doubt, in the next couple of uh, uh, couple of weeks, and I'm going to get uh, the CTO John Crockett, our local crypto anarchist. Uh, um, on a on a chat with you, so we can talk about a couple of projects and how we can use Doc Launch on a, on a couple of things to move them forward. Really appreciate your time. Thanks everyone for attending. And uh, there it is, another Blockchain Weekly. Uh, the, look towards uh, the YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in Blockchain Weekly. Uh, we'll have uh, last week's uh, broadcast uh, up in an hour or so, and then uh, uh, Mike yours will be up next week. Thanks guys. Appreciate it.